Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Opimium Wine Club, Opimium Club de Vin, uh, to our webinar today, Women in Wine Around the World. Thank you, thank you all for, for attending. Today, we're going to have five speakers from five different countries, along with Opimium's own Master of, of, master of Wines, Jane Masters, who are going to speak to us about the situation of uh, women currently and their aspirations for the years to come. Uh, just a few, uh, few housekeeping, uh, a few housekeeping matters. First and foremost, we are uh, 85 attendees, 85 participants today, most of whom are Opimia members, but not all. And I extend a special welcome to the non-members and I encourage you to consider uh, membership in Opimium. It's a, it's a great organization and we do enjoy our wine. Um, a few things, during the course of today, um, you are welcome to submit questions or comments. And Kim Tien of the, of the Opimium office will be curating the questions and feeding them in uh, at the moment she thinks is most appropriate. And then there'll be a, a, a final question period at the end. So do submit your questions um, throughout, throughout the, the one hour. We're scheduled for one hour. Um, if we run over slightly, it's, it's, not, it's not catastrophic. We can continue for a bit. And that's, uh, that's it. So who's, who's here today? We have Jane Masters from the United Kingdom. We have Corlia Furi from South Africa. We have Julia Soward from Chile. Morgan Le Breton from France. Beck Hardy from Australia. And Andrea Aby from Canada. So I'm going to start by asking uh, Jane to, to set the stage, if you will. And after Jane has spoken, um, we'll uh, invite the other speakers, one, of, uh, all, one at a time, of course, to introduce themselves briefly. So you'll have to hold on for a couple of minutes to hear each of their own introductions. So Jane, would you care to give us um, your thoughts of what is the place of women in the wine industry today? You've been around for a year or two. <laughs> what, <do> you, <laughs> what have you seen up until now and, and what's the situation now? Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Carol. So um, welcome, everybody. As Carol said, my name is Jane Masters. I'm a Master of Wine and I'm actually a consultant to the Opinion Wine Club. My role with Opinion is to taste and select all the wines that go into the cellar offerings and to write a lot of the descriptions and the um, drinking advice uh, for members. And I have to say that I have been very fortunate, as Carol said, for a number of years to um, I've been around and I've been very fortunate in building a career in wine uh, and, and a trade which I absolutely love. Um, having originally trained as a winemaker, I um, then went and spent a number of years working for a large retailer back in the UK, sourcing wines from around the world. And then after that, um, have worked as an independent consultant for a number of years, uh, working with um, clients across a whole, 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 in many different sectors of the wine trade. So I think I've sort of experienced and witnessed things um, pretty extensively within the trade. I'd start by saying that I think women have always had a role in wine, actually. And the reason I say that is that uh, if you take the traditional European wine producing countries, Italy, France, and Spain. Um, they have a long history of making wine. You go into any gallery around the world and you can find 17th, 18th century paintings that depict women in the fields picking grapes. Um, so women have already play, always played a role, but I would say that there are also women uh, historically who've been very influential in the wine trade. Um, great examples in the Champagne region. So Veuve Clicquot, who found herself a widow at the age of 27 years old in something like 1805. Um, Louise Pommery was another, another lady in Champagne. There are several others. And what's amazing is that this group of people, this group of ladies, women, 
um, at that time really drove the innovation in the region, innovation in terms of how wines were made, different styles of champagne, going off and in, investigating and developing different markets. They had brought a real innovation to the region that really set the, set the, um, set the basis, if you like, for what is the champagne industry today. And I think it's even more um, impressive when you think about the fact that actually Women didn't even get the vote in France until 1945. Um, and even when they got the vote in 1945, it wasn't until 1965 when a law was passed that women were actually allowed to open the bank accounts in their own name. They were allowed to choose a professional activity and they were allowed to manage their own affairs without asking the permission of their husbands. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, as Carol says, I've been around a few years, but fortunately I wasn't around at that time. Um, I've, my own interest in wine sort of peaked when I was a student. And after I finished a degree in biological chemistry, I wondered whether there was any way that I could find a job in wine. I wasn't necessarily sort of I didn't have a big master plan I didn't know exactly what I was going to do um, but I first went to France and ended up working as an intern for a cognac company and then after that I signed up and I did the Diplôme National Donologue in Bordeaux so I studied winemaking in Bordeaux um, at that time there were the year I graduated there were 53 people in the class and there were 16 women so it was about 30 percent 30 percent of us mm. Um, I looked on the um, alumni website uh, just in the last few days, just to prepare for, for our, our discussion today. And I was really pleased to see that actually last year, um, women represented 48% of the graduates. But when I actually looked at the year before that in 2019, it was actually 52, 53% women. And, and, and so there has been um, real progress, I would say. I would say that hands-on winemaking, hands-on winemaking is actually physically quite demanding. You know, there's a, there's a lot of time spent, long hours, Corlea will tell you all about this, long hours in quite um, dark cellars where it's quite cold and wet and you're, you're, you have to lift heavy things. And I think that that's often used as a reason why perhaps there aren't more female winemakers around. Um, and on top of that, I would also say, though, that you have to be sort of good at wanting, knowing how things work and being able to fix them. So there's a lot of equipment and pumps and electricity. And, and, um, and I think that actually, certainly when I was a kid, those are always considered sort of boys things rather than girls things. So I think um, perhaps um, that, has, that had a role to play. I'm not so sure it does anymore. Um, and certainly I've come across over the years condescending sort of attitudes, you know, a bit like if you take your car for a service at the local garage and the guy looks at you and says, you know, you're a woman, you won't understand how anything works underneath the bonnet. Well, actually, you know, you can get over those, those, um, those issues. And I don't think anything, if I'm completely honest, I don't think I've ever come across anything that's held me back in my career, which is, um, which is very lucky, I guess. The, um, I would say the British wine trade has been associated with being a bit old and fuddy-duddy and staid and perhaps full of um, older gents in blue pinstripe suits. And I would say that there are still pockets of that around. But even when I went and joined the wine buying department at Marks & Spencer, a large number of the big buyers in other multiple sort of retail chains were women. And in fact, many of the influential wine journalists at the time were also women. In terms of the master of wine, um, there are currently 418 of us uh, in the world operating, working, living in over 30 countries around the world. And of those 143 are women. So that's about 35%. If you think that the first uh, Master of Wine exams were held in 1953, it wasn't until 1970 that Sarah Morphew Stevens, who is an absolutely amazing lady, um, became the first master, female Master of Wine. And I think um, the exams were always open to men and to women, um, but 
given that they are trade exams and you need to have a proven sort of track record and experience in the trade, I've no doubt that that was a bit of a, a barrier to, to women not becoming master of wine sooner. Um, following on from Sarah, then uh, in 1979, it was the first year that they had the same equal numbers of men and women. And there has been in 2001, I think it was, more women actually passing than men that year. So, you know, things are shifting. The um, Wine and Spirit Education Trust, which is an organisation that runs qualifications for consumers and anyone that wants to go into the trade, they run um, qualifications at different levels. Again, they've seen a shift. So. Um, going back to 2003, probably about six, just under 60% of people that were signing up to do wine courses were male. And that's in total around, around the world. Um, last year, the balance had shifted. And so it was just slightly in favour of females. So something like 51% of all of their courses. But of course, there's going to be variation between countries and regions. And certainly in my travels in, in work around the world, you come into regions, areas that are much more hierarchical, much more patriarchal. Um, but there are still some surprises. So it was really surprising for me to learn this week that actually Bulgaria, believe it or not, leads the way. It has 43% of its wineries have female winemakers. Just to put that into context, last year in California, it's 4,200 plus wineries had just 14%, 14 of them had female winemakers in them. So, you know, it, it, it varies by region. It's not always as you might expect it to be. And finally, before I sort of hand uh, back to Carol, I would say that it's not all about numbers either. It's about opportunities. It's about roles and responsibilities that people are given. And um, I do think that I have seen in certain regions that whilst there may be women working in wine, in some places they tend to be more in the labs than in the cellar, more in the admin office side than in the senior uh, management positions or the leadership positions. Um, but that is something that the trade is, I think, very aware of, like many other industries are, and addressing and um, both the WSET and the Institute of Masters of Wine and various other trade bodies are, have, are, have put together certain initiatives and um, scholarships to give opportunities for people, not just for women, but for any, um, uh, all sorts of ethnic minority groups that may uh, have in the past been uh, on the end of some of these social in inequalities. So I think that uh, I will hand back to Carol, thank you. Thank you, Jane. I, I realize I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. My name is Carol <laughs> Fitzwilliam. I am the chair of the board of directors of Opimium. And um, uh, I am currently residing in Mexico. Um, where my biggest frustration in my life is that I can't get delivery of my opimium wines. So I've given a challenge to each of our speakers to introduce herself in one minute, in one minute. So let's start with uh, uh, Corlea, can you please introduce yourself and then I'll ask the next. Carol, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Corlea Furi, I'm from uh, Willington, South Africa a beautiful little quaint town. Uh, if I stand on my porch, I can see Table Mountain, some 70 kilometers away. Um, I'm married to a winemaker who is an avid cook. And because of that, I need to do trail running and I need to get outdoors and active so that I can have all of these wonderful food and wine that we're blessed with in our area. And um, yes, mother of a, a pair of pigeon twins, a boy and a girl age 10 and a 16 year old daughter who feels that she just might be 20 and two pugs. Um, so that's our crazy life um, here in the beautiful South Africa. Thanks, Corlea. Julia, would you introduce yourself, please? Well, um, my name is Julia Soward and I'm actually uh, British, but I live in Chile. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be living at the moment in a winery, which is um, probably one of the best places you can be during lockdown, I think. 
Um, the reason that I'm here is um, because I'm married to a winemaker, Roberto Echeverria, who is responsible for the Casanueva wines that you enjoy in Apimian. And um, how long have I been here? I've been here for 15 years, 16 years. Um, and we have two children. And, um, and I come to you today as an illustrator working in the wine industry. Is that a minute? Thanks, Julia. Oh, continue, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to stay under my minute. Yeah, I will alert everybody. I have a somewhat unstable internet connection, which just makes it a little more interesting. So bear with us. Morgan, please, can you introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. It's very exciting. So I am Morgan Breton from uh, Domaine de la Jasse, south of France, next to Montpellier. Uh, I am in charge of uh, marketing and communication at the estate. Uh, my parents arrived there 26 years ago. I was one. And uh, I've grown up in this estate, working in the vineyard, in the cellar a bit, uh, mostly helping during fairs and events and uh, selling wine in the shop. And I officially uh, joined the family business uh, four years ago. So my father is a winemaker and uh, he produced all the wines at uh, Domaine de la Jasse. And my mother is in charge of all the, the patrimony that we have, the environment, the biodiversity. So that's it about me. Thank you. Beck. Thank you very much. Um, here from very early in the morning in Australia. Um, so our family, um, the Hardy family, have been producing um, wines in Australia um, since the um, sort of 1850s, so a few years now. Um, and my husband and I, uh, Richard, we uh, purchased the Perderinga brand um, from my parents' um, last year um, but originally founded Beck Hardy Wines um, which are the wines that are in the opinion portfolio. Um, we actually started the business three days before um, our daughter was born. Um, she's now um, five years old. Um, so we've been going a little while in our own business um, but the Perderinga brand which is the predominant brand um, for our, for our um, company is actually uh, 40 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Andrea. Hello, Andrea Eby from uh, Winnipeg, Canada, and uh, I am, I guess, firstly, the mother of two wonderful, well, mostly wonderful teenage boys, and uh, in uh, for in sort of my day job, I work for the Wine Scholar Guild as their Italian programs manager, but have a long history in education, starting my sort of professional life as a school teacher, and then transitioning into wine after uh, um, having my children and I have worked as uh, an educator for WSCT and for the Wine Scholar Guild and also as a buyer for a store here in, in Winnipeg and um, yeah, I'm a master's of wine student so pursuing higher education always seems to be something I enjoy so uh, just looking to um, bring wine to as many people as, as possible through education. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, that's fabulous. Um, I'm going to direct questions to individual speakers uh, now. And after they've had a chance to answer, I'm going to invite our other speakers to jump in with comments or, or further, further questions or, or whatever uh, along that theme. So it's, it's, in, it's meant to be uh, informal and interactive. So uh, let's go. So I'm going to direct the first question to Corlea. And the question, Corlea, is with the increase of women in winemaking in your part of the world, do you think that um, that has influenced either the style of winemaking or has it influenced the customers in your, in your world? What, do you, what have you seen? Um, just getting back maybe to, I missed telling you where I'm from in that I'm the winemaker and head of wine and viticulture for Bosman Family Vineyards, an eighth generation family that produces wine, which is obviously also on the opium um, list, which we're very happy about. Um, so I come from, well, I work for a family who's been um, growing grapes and uh, in the wine business from 1699. 
Um, it's amazing history, uh, but to be quite honest, um, in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, managerial levels and women taking the seat and being at the table, this is very much the first generation of that being the status quo. I'm very happy to also report that um, in my team, we are four women winemakers. We absolutely take up then all of the winemaking capacity for our, for our business. Um, and in my class, just as Jane mentioned, in our class in, um, well, I'm going to give away my age, but some 20 years ago, we were actually 50-50 uh, in terms of male to female ratio in our um, graduate class. It did, uh, you know, it's, it's very true then that most of my um, uh, classmates then went into places of work in the wine industry, which didn't uh, necessarily meant prim primary production and or agriculture as such, marketing um, and uh, let's say a product um, representation is definitely where we see most of these wonderful ladies being applied. I think it's fantastic though, that they come from this fantastic wine background and that these services are rendered from a place of knowledge and a place of an understanding of our, of our industry. But um, that being said, I think uh, we would definitely put uh, our customers into a little box if we would think that winemaking has changed because of the different demographics of, uh, let's say, buying power. We do know that women now um, do buy so much more wines um, you know, um, as a winemaking decision. But I also think it's because the ways in which we can buy wine has changed. A club, a wine um, a fraternity like Opimium gives um, ladies the opportunity to make decisions without being, you know, uh, confronted with going into a place where they don't feel comfortable, you know, and that comes with all of this wonderful stories and beautiful catalogs and things like that. So yes, uh, wine buying for women has changed. And yes, we see more of them buying. But I think as winemakers, um, there are more important things, things like drinkability, um, uh, where these wines are from, provenance. Um, so, and those things play such a big role that I think tr uh, trickling that down that into the customer, um, if it happens, it's fantastic. But um, what winemakers have brought to the table, I think women, are the fact that we are great storytellers and that wines actually are stories that wants to be heard and needs to be told. And I also see that women get more involved when they're winemakers, even with wine conceptualization. What does the label look like? What is the, what's the texture of the label? Um, how are we going to communicate it? Even things like social media and how we relate to that. I think women are quite savvy when it gets to telling those stories and getting involved from the vineyard almost up into the glass. But um, in short, and to make sure that there's some opportunity for questions, I think that's that's what I've found it's in the last 18 years of winemaking and, and being a winemaking a woman in wine. Well, thank you, Coralia. I can't help but ask you, when you're making, when you are making wine, do you ever, uh, is the, are you ever targeting either a male or a female drinker in what you're, in the decisions you're making? Or are you rather focusing on making the best wine and whoever, whoever drinks it is great? I, I would have to say that uh, for me, it's all about drinkability and being true to where these grapes are from. So in our business, no one single grape is, uh, harvested without a very specific end um, wine in, in sight. And, uh, and in that whole regime, the idea is that that grape will show and shine and um, you know, speak to some, someone and something. Um, sometimes it means these wines are quite forceful, um, but sometimes they're really delicate and ethereal and they need to tell people where they're from, from a very specific place. For instance, we have an old vine, Chenin Blanc, the third oldest Chenin Blanc vineyard in South Africa. There, that, that vineyard tells its own story. The wine definitely does too. So I think um, it actually makes it easier if you have the wines and you're just curating those stories um, and looking after it as best as possible. Um, so in our case, trying to not manipulate and find the people that relate to our product and relate to our wine business. 
if that if that answers it. Thanks. Does anybody, uh, any of our other speakers, want to jump in on this? No, if not, I'm going to move right along then to Julia. Julia, you're an artist, and uh, you have been obviously watching wine and winemaking for many years and the arts, and now you, you design labels. Can you tell us, please, what do you see uh, in, in your, from where you are is the influence of art in winemaking and perhaps the influence of winemaking on art? Well, <clears throat> I, feel, I feel slightly a little bit like an imposter when, uh, when, I, when I kind of talk about myself as an, as an artist um, in wine, because although I, st I started in wine probably about 20 years ago, and um, I was just having a little chat with Jane about it, um, I started working for a company which was, um, which was entirely men, and I was the only, I was the only woman. It was, um, it was just full of, it was just all sort of those kind of pinstriped, pinstriped men in their fifties and sixties that were selling sort of Bordeaux and, and Burgundy and all, you know, old world wine. Um, so that, that was always kind of my career in wine. Um, and it's only really in the last two years, I would say that, um, that I have two, three years that I've started um, um, doing designing wine labels. I think that was always probably a, um, um, a, a latent sort of need in me to, to, to draw and, but um, so, so, but I, one of the things that has, um, uh, one of the, um, the, uh, the corners, that I feel that has been turned in the wine industry is the sort of the growth of the natural wine segment. Um, and, um, and those are sort of, that's where I have sort of been, that's where I've been focusing on in terms of wine label design. And, um, and it feels like, um, it feels to me like a kind of, um, um, in a way, a mirror image of some sort of social a lot of sort of social movements that are going on right now, which is that, is that um, it's wine is something that needs to be for everybody. You know, it needs to be something that's, that's inclusive and that's not taken too seriously and that's fun. And, um, and that, yeah, like, like Corella said, tells a story and, um, and relates to provenance as well. Like, so that's but you must have seen uh, changes in wine labels in all your years involved with vine vineyards uh they are, they don't look today like they did 50 years ago no i mean if you look at i i went onto the internet and had a look at i had sort of had a look at the evolution of wine labels and uh and they were really all quite the same for for like really out kind of hundreds and hundreds of years and then it was sort of it was sort of um Rothschild that that um that started to um put art on labels and and um they were putting on like Andy Warhol and and Chagall and some some really sort of major artists at that time um and and um but I think I, I feel like with the natural wine movement, that's just like the, all of that, all of the sort of the rules that we that we sort of that we knew about about wine labels and how to present a wine has sort of been have been sort of blown out of the water. And, and now it's just like anything, anything goes. And um, especially in terms of sort of as well as in terms of terminations as well. Now we're doing. Um, we're doing what like the pet nuts with crown caps and we're doing um lack uh, we're we're putting lacquer you know on the top of the bottle like this um it, what do you call it in english is it lacquer wax wax yeah wax, wax. I'm, I'm saying it, it's like lacquer in spanish 
we're doing the crown crap it's like and like and suddenly you're kind of thinking why does the label even have to be square you know and does it even have to go on the front of the bottle could it go on the could it go on the shoulders and and why you know and and being sort of conscious of the the sort of the the recycle recyclability of of packaging and labels and stuff like that so it feels to me like there's like a like um, there's been a big kind of um, um, awareness and 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 challenging of of like of nor norms and and things like that, which seems to me be part to be part of a wider sort of social context in general about about yeah. about anything. Yeah. You know, if you can challenge that, yeah. you know, you can just you can just really challenge anything. Which is Thanks, Julia. Yeah. I'm not sure if you stopped or my internet interrupted you, but I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to I'm going to turn it over to our, our uh, colleagues, uh, some of the others. Uh, any thoughts on wine labeling and art? And uh, anybody well, else want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I'd like to jump in. Um, I Go really ahead. connected because I truly believe that wine is a, a cultural pro product. You know, it's part of a culture and a, a global movement, like you said. So when you take the culture of label design, then it makes total sense to have this in, this really beautiful cultural project that is just not only about the bottle and the wine itself, but with the the label too. Like you have people creating. Uh, the, the product, the, the wine, people creating the label, people creating the bottle, everyone is thinking of this cultural product as a whole. And then it's really part of a, a very bigger movement. So I, I really like your philosophy and I totally join you uh, on that, yeah. Thanks. Anyone else, no? So, so Morgan, I'm gonna jump in to, you, to ask you a question now. You're a young woman and you have just recently uh, uh, join the family business. Um, are the pressures as a young woman joining a family business different than those for a young man today? Have or or have we moved beyond those those horrible pressures that women uh, have lived with in the past? And you can say no. It's the the playing field is totally even. Everybody's got a chance to thrive. What, tell us what you think about at your stage of your career. So um, I joined family business four years ago and uh, I have no one education. I studied marketing and economics. And so yes, I, to be really honest, I felt the pressure when I began, like I, I knew my value and I really knew I belonged here, but I felt that I really had to prove myself to the wine world, you know? Um, but I, I'm really lucky to be surrounded by kind and amazing stakeholders and uh, starting with my, my colleagues and uh, well, my, my father, of course, being the head of the company. And I remember one day he told me, uh, you're seen as the future. So I was considering myself as the daughter of, you know, I thought people would see me as the daughter of, and he said, no, no, you're seen as the future because whether it's you or, your brother uh, joining us, uh, it means that the, the family has a plan for the company to, to last, you know, in the future. So I thought, okay, the future is female. I'm, I'm totally fine by this right now. So I thought that's okay. But then with your question, I'm, I'm starting to think, okay, I, I have a brother, I have a sister too. Well, my sister is a, a communication consultant as a at a publicist agency, so she's not into wine, but my brother, he's gonna turn 21 and he's uh, an engineer studying wine. He's gonna get uh, the winemaker license too. So he's getting the full wine education. So he might join the, the family business at some point if he wants to. And I'm thinking, would it be different for him or not? So I, I have very uh, great family. So I don't think uh, they would, people would react differently with him. But I guess, uh, well, being a young woman wanting to have a family on my own at some point, maybe they're gonna be this talk, you know, about uh, can I uh, take some time away for myself to, uh, to start something on my own? So this could be a topic, but I'm sure my family would 
look at it from a family point of view, you know, not from a, a boss having to replace someone in the company. So this is this is fine. But again, that's because I'm lucky and I'm sure in other businesses, you don't have this luck sometimes. I think as a young woman joining your family business, uh, the most important thing is to know your value. And it's not just about uh, being a winemaker or a vine grower to be part of the wine world and the wine industry. Like I said, I, I don't have a wine education. I often present myself as my father is the winemaker and he made me a wine lover to kind of justify that I, I do belong here because I do love wine and I do love what I do in communication and marketing. But if you're an accountant and join your family winery, you totally belong here. And of course, at the beginning, you're probably gonna be known as the daughter of, but in the future, you're gonna be known for the value that you brought to the company. And I think that's the most important thing, whether you're a, a logistic master, a label designer, yeah, an accountant or a tractor driver, you totally belong here and you have your spot here. So uh, I think it's uh, this cleavage, uh, of course, female male. Thanks. Anybody else wish to jump in? Well, uh, Carol, I before you're going to go to the next question, I'd like to come back to the previous topic of the label. We had a question um, saying how, how much does the label influence wine purchase? And that's a question was asked by Diane. And I saw that back also um, kind of start to answer. And I think I'd like to bring it back to this conversation. So I'd mm -hmm. like. So well, did you all hear uh, the, influence, the influence of the wine label on the purchasing? What's, what, are, what is anybody jump in on that one? What is your feeling of the importance of the wine label? How does that influence the purchase? I think it's super important. Corlea, do you want to? Oh, okay, Julia. Yeah, thanks. Oh well, just very quickly. I just think it's. I think it's super important. I think if you, if you, um, well, firstly, I know it's like it's the face of the product, isn't it? It's like in any in any product you see anywhere, if a lot of time and effort and care has gone into it, you can assume, I think, that the that a lot of time and care and effort has gone into into the product. I would say there's a huge relationship. Um, between them and also um, also I think a well-designed label just like a well-designed brand um, should should encapsulate the the product and the the uh, the motives and the motivation behind behind the people who make it so I think fundamental I yeah can I'd like else? Also, uh, Carol oh, go can ahead I just I, um, I want to ask this question to Beck as uh, she launched the, uh, the leader's brand and it's very feminine, elegant, and on a perspective on the younger side, we saw it here at the office. Uh, what was the, um, the story as opposed to when you were working from uh, your dad, having a label completely different? How did you bring that um story to to yours on through the labels yeah, thanks so much for that <clears throat> sorry <laughs> um that um the sparkling label um that we've sold um, and also the opinion um sorry the the tipsy hill that we're selling um through the last offer with opinion um that floral label is actually based um tipsy on the tipsy hill garden which is here where we live um, and this is sort of like the heart of Beck Hardy Wines. We're going to be doing open gardens here next weekend and going to have about 1,500 people co coming through the garden. Um, and everything on that label is represented. Um, it's from the garden. So we have um, Australian fauna and fauna. And it's, it, although it is quite floral and there's birds, um, it appeals to a lot of girls, but it also appeals to a lot of guys as well because um, if environmentally and nature, a lot of people love nature and being outdoors. So it really appeals to, I think, both, both sexes. Um, the sparkling, it's amazing how many men have said the same thing, how much they love the label. Where When I designed it, because um, I, I designed that one as well, um, when I did that one, I was sort of appealing more for the women. Um, but it's amazing how many men have, have really liked that one as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. If I could add just from the buying perspective, I would say that it's really, um, yeah, absolutely critical when you're making those buying decisions, looking at those labels. And, you know, there would be wines that I would love and would be, you know, would so want to bring in large quantities of them and just knew looking at the label that it was going to be a really tough sell. Whereas, you know, opposed to some other wines that had such a fantastic label and you knew that you weren't going to have to have like a hand sell kind of a situation for those wines. And so, um, you know, from that buying side of things, it was definitely something that was always taken into consideration. Interesting, fascinating. So Beck, um, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, what was the best piece of advice that you received throughout your career that you would want to pass on to the next generation of, of women vintners? Uh, what would it be? Um, the, the advice I got is actually not related to wine um, directly. And it was actually my grandma um, who is very much into the environment. And she um, has this little, little quote that I, I love to use, which is use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. And it's very much about um, just using what you have, not being wasteful. Um, and that's something that I think is so important to everyone. Um, she actually went on um, in now 40 years ago to start um, um, Nature Foundation, which is uh, doing a lot in, here in South Australia. Um, it's the third largest conservation land holder um, of land in Australia. And I'm now on the board of Nature Foundation. And that sort of links back to what we're doing um, in the vineyard as well. Um, and in the winery, and we're just trying to be a bit more sustainable. Um, things like, um, like looking at lighter weight bottles. And I know that's something that Jane certainly um, uh, been talking about for a lot of years. And in the UK, especially um, the, the lighter weight bottles um, is bigger. And um, one of our, our big wine, the Tipsy Hill, is currently in a very, very large bottle, uh, which is from the, the wines by Jeff Hardy days. Um, but we are looking at a lighter weight bottle. And then just in the, in the vineyard as well, we're going to be putting sheep in the vineyard this year. Um, which will be helping um, keep the, the grass low as well as adding some nutrients as well. So we're looking um, at more um, nature and the environment. Um, I found it really interesting listening to uh, Corlea about um, what's happening there in South Africa because a lot of the trends that are happening over there with women in wine are the same that's here um, with when I went through, I studied viticulture. Um, there was about half for women, but then so many do drop out with kids and everything like that. But then a lot of coming back. Um, we have a lot of women um, like she does as well working um, in the business and we, we are able to have a lot of women because we, we're a lot more flexible than a lot of other companies. We allow um, people to work from home so they can do school pickup and drop off or um, they work 0.8 uh, rather than full time so they're able to do um, look after kids. So um, we're being very flexible and trying to encourage um, women into the wine industry. Um, we've also recently um, um, employed a new, sorry, my little daughter's at the door, knocking on the door, wanting to come in now. Um, so we've recently employed a new winemaker, also called Beck, um, and she's um, recently returned from Napa Valley. Um, and she was looking for something that wasn't full time. So we, um, it actually works really well for us because we're just sort of fairly new. We didn't need a full time winemaker. Um, and so it's working perfectly. And so Beck's um, able to you know, work around the, she has three girls. Um, and and for, for us also having um, a female role model for Matilda, our little five-year-old is, is very important to us. So yeah, it's been great having a, a new female winemaker join the team. Thanks, Beck. Who else would like to offer a pearl of wisdom that they received that they would pass on to the next generation? Oh, come on, you guys. I know you all know you have something brilliant to, to contribute. If I could, it's actually not, it's not a piece of a quote. I think, Beck, that quote was fantastic. Um, but um, in thinking about uh, people who helped me in the industry. I must be very honest in that uh, those people were mostly male. 
and um, in maybe looking at the the moment where I felt most um, vulnerable was actually in a in wine environment where we had a function and a group of winemakers were supposed to be filling glasses and entertaining tables and uh, a winemaker was um, assigned to each table. I was assigned to a table where um, a guest at the table had asked the organizers if they could just swap me out with a male winemaker but this was a lady so I think the, the important thing here is that um, for women I think the important thing is that we should look for those those opportunities where we can really help and be of assistance and um, you know uh, champion women so um, yes I, I don't know if that helps a lot but since that moment I knew that if I could help a female winemaker I would <laughs> I would like to, yeah, I would like to kind of echo that as well, because I think that's been maybe one of the kind of major shifts I've noticed in the last few years is that previously, maybe there were fewer opportunities, it seemed for a lot of women in the industry. And so it almost seemed more of a competitive sort of environment. And in the last sort of, you know, five, 10 years, I see much more sort of supporting of each other and, and trying to foster opportunities for one another. And it's such a kind of refreshing direction that uh, the industry is taking. So Andrea, on a slightly different, uh, different note, you're involved primarily in education. Do you see um, women being more interested in wine education recently? Do you see a shift in, in recent years or what's your take on that? Yeah, I would say Jane has kind of touched on quite a few of the sort of things that I was thinking about when I was asked this question and, you know, from the looking sort of from um, the grassroots kind of level with WSET courses, I I've definitely seen more and more women uh, enrolling in, in the courses here. Our sort of um, market is perhaps a fairly young market in terms of wine appreciation. And so um, when we first started teaching the classes, it seemed as if it was predominantly men that were, um, that were joining the classes. Many of them um, sort of doctors and lawyers that actually were from South Africa or the UK and had this kind of um, sort of history with wine more. And through the years, I've seen more and more women I think feeling comfortable in in wine education and um, realizing that uh, you know if you if you love wine you enjoy wine then that's a good enough reason to get into into these classes and learn more and I think as well we've seen more and more opportunities as I mentioned and so there's more sort of uh, incentive to to take the classes and um, I would say that you. You seem to see more women in the, you know, if I'm speaking of the WSCT classes, sort of levels one and two and three, and then historically there was fewer continuing on to the diploma levels, but I think that is even changing as well. And I think that also has to do with the fact that um, many employers are becoming more supportive of the other roles that women often play. And uh, I think that's critical to seeing women kind of make their way up through those uh, educational systems. And um, yeah, I, I've also noticed more and more opportunities for scholarships that are targeted towards women. And you know, hopefully with more scholarships, then the, the industry will make room for those women as well as they take advantage of those scholarships and, and have uh, more uh, kind of CEO positions and that sort of thing becoming available to women. And I had just, I had read a recent article that Jancis Robinson had just um, mentioned that uh, they had a, I, I believe it was some sort of uh, um, kind of protest to the government about Brexit and, and the, all the regulations that come along with it with the wine industry and that of the 52 signatories on the, the, the survey sort of thing, only four of those CEOs were, were women. And so I think that still, that still sounds not enough. <laughs> and so, um, you know, there's a lot of room in the industry to see more, more women in those positions uh, of power and influence. And I think the more education there is out there, then the, the more chances there are for, for women to, to end up there. So. I, I, I certainly echo your, your aspiration. Um, <laughs> 
Anybody have anything else to add on education? And otherwise I'll move on to Can I, our I would last question, which is for Jane. Oh. That's it. All right, so Jane, um, where do you think we're gonna go uh, in the future with diversity, either gender or other diversity? What, what's your sense of where, where we're heading and uh, how it will influence the wine industry. Oh, um, Carol, I'm sorry, before we uh, go with uh, Jane, as we, you were yeah. asking the question, there was someone who had a question for Andrea. Um, okay. uh, um, is there evidence that more women tend to be super tasters? Do you find there is an increasing number of women who enroll in classes? Well, I think there's definitely some sort of scientific evidence that suggests that women have um, some maybe superior skills in some areas of tasting, just um, from an evolutionary sort of standpoint. But, uh, you know, I think anyone can train themselves to be a fantastic taster. And, um, you know, the whole super taster idea is also related to sort of um, sensitivities that each individual has to, to certain qualities in, in wines and in different foods, et cetera. But I really feel it's not a um, something that should determine your future in the industry. You can work really hard to become a, a great taster, no matter sort of what nature has granted you in, in the beginning. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of my, my if, if you're lucky enough to be sort of blessed with some of those inherent abilities, great, but it's definitely not, uh, you know, a something that you should um, feel you need to have in order to to rise to the, the top of the industry. And uh, just uh, for women who, not women, anyone who wants, to, well, women who wants to go uh, get some funding, there's our philanthropic uh, organizations that were highlighted, like Le Demain des Coffee in and BC had some grants from uh, that was attributed in in that chapter, but it's encouraging uh, women who wants to to pursue um, a common saying that there are organizations offering grants. Great. So thanks uh, for the question, Kim Chien, and whoever I, gave it to you. You got another one for us? No, I just want because you know you sometimes another... the lagging. I just want to. Make sure that yeah. we're not missing any more questions before we pass them to Jane. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but um, I think there's no. No, other no, thank questions. you for doing so. Great. Thanks, Jane. Go ahead. Jane. Jane. So, Jane, do you remember the question? <laughs> um, well, I think it. I think I remember the question was about you know, get out your crystal, polish off your crystal ball, and tell us what's happening in the future. So, I will try. Um, I mean, I, it's very interesting listening to Andrew. I think um, that uh, the idea of diversity, not just for women, but for all um, ethnic minority groups is certainly top of front of mind in many, many wine companies, whether they're, um, you know, large or small in hospitality or in sort of uh, strictly wine businesses. Um, just listening to the experience and and the different perspectives that everyone's coming from this evening has just been absolutely fascinating i would say that actually for any woman that's interested in a career in wine i mean just go for it it's um yeah it's a fantastic trade it's full of really interesting fantastic people lots of history different geographies different amazing different regions culture it's social it's sociable um, and then of course there's just the sheer diversity of, of of wines to discover and to try so I think it's a, a fascinating industry but then I would say that wouldn't I um, I also think that um, like all industries or trades um, though we are at a pretty critical point in time um, you know, the pandemic has thrown everything up in the air, um, but even more so, climate change is a big and urgent issue for the world, um, but it's also affecting um, wine production. We know it's affecting wine production. You know, we see in South Africa, in Australia, 
So in particular, we've seen series of droughts and wildfires and all these things are, are linked to um, climate change. So I think there are a lot of challenges ahead. And we know that, you know, business researchers will tell you that um, better decisions, better um, solutions are found by having diverse groups of people bringing different perspectives working together and collaborating together so I see that actually and all the things that Beck Tech uh, touched on in terms of sustainability it's not just bottle weights but use of land use of water resources um, how we impact on that is things have got to change you know wine has been around for millennia and I want to make sure I want to do my best to make sure that it will be around for future generations to enjoy and to love and I think undoubtedly, undoubtedly, women have got a role to play in that. Um, and so what I would like to see and what I hope and what I think will happen is that um, wine companies will embrace diversity and encourage it and um, at all levels of the business. So whether it's people working in the vineyards themselves, in the wine cellars, um, or as Andrea touched on, people in leadership positions or in, on, you know, in governance, sitting on uh, boards, um, in, in the case of larger or publicly listed companies. Um, I hope that we will move towards that. I think the signs are there that, it, it, that things have moved. And um, I, I, I'm confident, hopeful, that they will continue to, to, to do that. Thanks, Jane. Anyone else want to jump in with their crystal ball of what the next few years in the wine industry look like? I don't know what it's going to look like, but I, I surely totally agree with you with Jane. And uh, I think it's, well, we've seen tonight uh, brilliant people and brilliant women talking about what they do right now. And what we do now has an impact on tomorrow. And I think we've all ha we all have this kind of sustainable vision of what we do now is for the next generation. Uh, I'm not a mother, well, yet I hope, but you've all presented yourself as a mother. And it means that you, talk, you think about the future because of course, whatever you're gonna do is going to have an impact on your children's life. And that's what we do with wine too. We do wine to keep it in a cellar and to share it with our generation later, you know? So um, I think the story goes on and on and that's, uh, we keep winding the middle of it and that's the beauty of, uh, of this product and what we do actually. Kim, Tian, have you got any, any questions, comments that you want to bring forward? I see that there've been lots of comments that I haven't been able to read, but... Uh... Uh, no, we did address those comments and uh, questions. Well, then, then that's it. Well, this has been lots of fun. Uh, and without uh, a doubt, it would have been more fun to do it in person, all of us together. But the chances of bringing us all from all points of the world together over a glass of wine isn't going to happen this year. And who knows when it will. This has been a, a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank Jane and Julia and Morgan and Andrea and Kulia and Beck. I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your very, very busy lives to, uh, to share your thoughts for the Opimia membership uh, who are in attendance today. I want to thank you all for listening. And I think that's it. Oh, a last minute comment question arrive. It's, <laughs> it's always, Beck, can you repeat your grandma's quote about sustainability? I will, absolutely, I'd love to. It's use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. That's fabulous, fabulous. T-shirt, it's a t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you, everyone. This has been lots of fun. Thank you so much for the Cheers. opportunity. Cheers.